We are back with another episode of the Do As I Say, Not As I Did podcast. And as always, the name kind of explains everything. We're giving you advice based on everything we did wrong the first time. Each week, I bring on founders, investors, product experts, technology futurists, sales gurus, and just about anyone who is very smart and can help us work out how to build great businesses. And then together, we answer the questions about what's going on in your lives and in your businesses. We get these questions from people sending them in or we get them from Reddit. And really just questions that guests have never seen before. So I'm reading them out and they're hearing them live for the first time the same as you. So if you do have questions or you're trying to put out fires, send us an email uh, and we're going to workshop it on the show. So send those emails through to podcast at joeldietrapati.com. That is one hell of an email. So I'm going to put that in the show notes and you can just copy and paste that later on. Uh, I'm your host, Joel Ditrapani, and I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Vigo, which is an ATEX scale-up. We've grown it through Australia and the UK, and we're now focused on the promised land, the US. On top of that, I'm an advisor and a coach in the product space where I help startups and businesses work out how to lead and build and run great product teams, because that is the secret to building great products people actually want to use. And today, I'm excited to be joined by Polly Allen, an AI product coach and advisor, and the founder of AI Career Boost, the world's first AI-focused career accelerator helping leaders thrive in business roles for AI and machine learning projects. Before this, Polly has worked at a number of incredible software companies in product and software roles. But most notably, she led the development of the first generative AI used by Alexa at Amazon. You might have heard of that one. Uh, And and because Polly isn't busy enough, she also is the co-host of the AI After Hours podcast. Polly is an absolute expert at everything AI and particularly what it actually means to have AI in your business. So let's jump into it. Welcome, Polly. Thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm super excited. I, <laughs> I hope I can add, add some value to these questions here. Well, uh, before we jump to the questions, do you mind telling me a little bit more about AI Career Boost? Yeah, no problem. Um, so I had definitely seen in my role at Amazon that there was a distinct lack of diversity in the leadership in the AI space. Um, so I left last November, uh, November 2022, to found AI Career Boost, specifically to help increase access to careers in AI uh, for folks who maybe don't necessarily have a technical background or know how to program. I did come from a technical background. My background's in computer science and as a software engineer before I got into product, but I quickly realized that wasn't the skills that were most needed in the product space right now working with with these technologies. So I really wanna help product leaders leverage their existing strengths and just get the base, bases, basics they need from uh, from tech to uh, in a top-down way instead of having to go back to school, get a master's degree in data science or learn to program, do a boot camp um, and get them on the road to leadership careers in AI as quickly as possible. I love it. Well, let's uh, let's try and help the audience get their careers into AI right now and let's jump into some, cha- into some questions and some challenges. Okay. So you know who this is. It's me, Sponsorship Joel. And as usual, I have some very important advice for you. And that advice is get Miro, goddammit. I love them, and you probably already love them, but if you don't yet, you will love them. And they're our sponsors, so show some goddamn respect. This episode and this podcast is brought to you by Miro. Now, look, regular people, not listeners of this podcast, but normal, regular people probably think that Miro is just some digital whiteboard. But they're wrong. But that's okay, we understand, they're normal. They aren't smarter and better like the listeners of this podcast. Because we know that Miro's capabilities run far beyond just a digital whiteboard. We know it's a visual collaboration tool that my whole team personally uses and any team and your team can use to build on each other's ideas and create something meaningful together from anywhere in the world. And today, I actually wanna tell you about some of the new AI features I actually discovered myself this week in Miro. I've been so excited about this all week that I've just been spooking this regardless. And I thought, hey, what a better time to tell everyone than in reading this to you guys. So first of all, you're gonna thank me for this. Press Command K when you're in Miro. It just brings up this like command bar that I'd never seen before, but I just accidentally stumbled upon it. So Command K, that's a hack in itself. But then once you press that, it actually gives you all of these options. The first options in that are just all like AI tools that you can use to create or, or to run your workshops. So here are the options. Generate sticky notes, generate a sequence diagram, generate an image, generate code, generate mind map, or generate cards with user stories. 
Gen so really you just type in any prompt any prompt you want about something you're trying to do and then you can create any of these things you can create an entire diagram about just from an idea that you have of something you want you can create images i love the generating cards with user stories that's why i'm constantly planning out our product sometimes we just don't know where to get started and and what a user is actually going through so give it a bit of context it just comes up with such a good starting point this these tools have genuinely made my workshops and meeting prep so much easier this week now not every note is perfect i'll be honest but they give you such a great starting point that it just saves you like an insane amount of time so try that tool out i i i really love this and i've used it for every meeting i've had this week so as always get miro when you sign up today you get your first three miro boards free forever this isn't just like a small you know try the miro board for 30 days if whatever you do this week or whatever you do this month you get to keep that forever so just start those miro boards and actually just give it a go so sign up today at Miro.com slash podcast. And because I talk so quickly and with an Australian accent, I'm going to spell it out. M-I-R-O dot com, I guess dot C-O-M slash podcast. All right, let's jump back into the questions. This challenge is called, does generative AI like chat GPT live up to the hype? I want to know if business owners are really using chat GPT or any other generative AI to boost their productivity and does it actually result in increase in profitability or is it just all hype and too good to be true? All I see on social media is people promoting ChatGPT as a productivity tool, but most of them are just selling something such as courses on ChatGPT and attached affiliate marketing. Nothing bad about that here, but I want to know are there real people using these technologies to improve their businesses in e-commerce, SaaS, online consulting, etc. From ambassador number 9072. Super question, and it's so timely right now. Um, I don't know if you saw the the Gartner uh, hype cycle that came out in August, but generative AI was like right at the peak, po po at the maximum hype level, ready to dive down into the trough of disillusionment. And I definitely feel like that's the vibe this fall, um, especially when people are talking to people in finance or health, these like safety critical areas. Um, if these systems are like, they're cool, but if they can only get to 70% accuracy, like that's a toy. That's not something we can use really in production, right? Um, I think the areas we've definitely got proof that there is, you know, a uh, stake and not just sizzle are in the individual productivity. The studies on, on individual productivity have definitely shown BCG recently came out with a study. There was another one um, done earlier in the spring where um, just things like writing memos and doing research, internal research can be vastly accelerated by these tools and really help like the lower end. So you, early career people, inexperienced people, people who don't ha necessarily have a lot of language skills, they can very quickly perform like middle or top tier performers. So it's really flattening that curve and bringing everyone up to the next level in terms of productivity. So that savings and productivity is something people should be like able to unleash right away. Right. Um, what I'm excited about is that a lot of the engineering um, stuff, the engineering efforts right now are focused around mitigating some of these bigger problems with LLMs that are keeping them from being uh, really uh, de delivering a lot of impact at, at the enterprise level, right? So um, we've got engineering techniques that are using more information retrieval with a little sprinkle of LLM on the top, um, or we have um, even just like enterprise grade solutions coming out of Azure and AWS that mitigate some of the worries about privacy and your data being used for training models and things. It just made the whole thing a no-go for a lot of people. So I still believe that we'll get to pass the trough of disillusionment and actually see productive value come out of these these areas. And I do think we are seeing some some tools definitely gaining traction, right? I had noticed just the other day, I was creating a type form and they had like an AI, they'll you know, tell us what you want in the type form in natural language saved me a whole lot of pointing and clicking, like it 100%, you know, saved me time as a user, I would come back to that, right. Um, so it's, it's, I think there's hundreds and hundreds of tiny incremental improvements that products are going to make. And it'll be interesting to see what bigger kahuna moonshots come out of this, um, that really show like what's possible with this technology in the, the next six to 12 months. Yeah, I'm so about it. Like, I, I do not think it's hype. And this, this might age poorly. So if it ages poorly, you know, send me this clip in two years. But like, 
<laughs> AI is a transformative technology, and it's been around for a long time. But like this, this new wave, it's like billion billion dollar companies will get created today. So yeah. like invest. But what I what I want to ask is like you know, you said that there is this productivity increase for individuals. Your whole job is training people how to get into ai how do you use ai in your business how is it being used to make your business easier like you give us a quick example with, with typeform but what other kind of like tools are you using to for your own and your team's productivity so i've just enabled i'm super excited to enable the transcripts on um on zoom calls um again it was it was funny to me that i was jumping through hoops to get them before and downloading a recording and having to put them in another tool finally zoom just enable transcripts yeah. by default <laughs> um but uh the um the the way you can reuse that content when you have a transcript of it is pretty awesome right so um whether it's client calls where with their permission i'm using their information to like tailor um, tailor curriculums, like based on our discussion, right? Um, that's something now that I can like, I've done it a couple times, I can now hand that off to my to my assistant, or even like automate a lot of it using chat GPT and saying like, hey, based on this call, which of these modules, it d- does this person need to focus on? Let's reflect that in the Canva guide that we're, we're creating for them, right? That kind of thing. I'm, I'm double checking all these things. But it's really nice to be able to have the mechanics of creation done that way. Um, Lots of different learning guides, right? So if you, some people learn by audio, video, some people learn by the written word. So all of a sudden, instead of having to create all those different modalities, um, I can just create one and then reuse it in all the different ways people might learn, create quizzes based on that, that kind of thing. So for education, like educators, it's a huge boon, I think, because you can, it just massively, you know, keeps your content creation side, like, um, 10x, 10x is your content creation capabilities right away. Yeah, yeah, I think there's some great examples. I, I just struggle to think about elements of my day that aren't now influenced and and accelerated by yeah. by the use of AI. Like, it's. I think this question was a lot easier to answer a few months ago when the AI tools were still outside of your platform, but it's just getting so built into everything. Um, so. You know, if if I answer this question at a high level, like is is generative AI hype or is it real? It's like in my opinion, it's one hundred percent real, and it massively impacts my day and my week yeah. in, in what I do. And I think for uh, like the different levels in an organization, it can massively impact. Like I look at my engineers, like the copilot that's built into into their IDEs is extreme. Like they just use it like constantly throughout the day, without ever, mm-hmm. without without ever leaving what they do. Okay. Um, I I think about the content creation is is so much easier because of AI. Like with this podcast, you know, uh, the editing of it, super super. I guess like accelerated because of AI. <laughs> like um, oh, the, yeah. the transcripts that can come out of this for subtitles, that's all not done by me. That's done by AI tools. Um, the, the clipping, it's all done like that as well. Then like you know, I use Miro a lot. As you probably know, like because they're the sponsor, of the, the, they're, they sponsor the podcast. But like all their AI tools are so easy to use. So like you come in there, you're starting a new project, it just puts ideas out there. So like, I think that zero to one creation of, of whether it's new content yeah. or a workshop. Like I use it all the time, but personally, I just always keep one screen at my setup open with ChatGPT, and that's just it's my go-to tool. I love using it because I still think it's the best tool, at least like okay. the, the best you know I, chat I interface love- tool. I do love, I have been falling in love with Claude too. Claude is great, um, just actually. It's so much for the, lo- for the longer context tasks, right? So um, yeah. that thing where you want to take a whole transcript from an hour long session you've had, right? Um, a chat, just, chat GPT just can't do it yet. Um, so, yeah. and I, but I have done sometimes the thing where I'm like getting what I want from a transcript and then like switching over to chat GPT. I love to play with both tools, but yeah. I agree. It's it's kind of like my second brain now, right? I won't do a presentation yeah. without doing some brainstorming. Um, I like to start with kind of my own take so that like if it's half formed, it doesn't get like overwritten by potentially the lowest common denominator for a question yeah. that might be coming out of chat GPT. But I'm always going and going, oh, like, what did I miss? And, you know, critique yeah. this for me, that kind of thing. And I was like, man, it's like having an expert in your in your pocket at all times. So, yeah, 
that's a good thing it's like having an expert in your pocket like it's someone to just to bounce ideas off it. and that's what i love like it helps me with that initially getting started the transcript stuff super interesting as well like all of our meetings internally now we record using a platform called fireflies so we can go back through and even just small stuff like oh i'm uh i'm speaking 80 percent of the meeting i shouldn't be i should be speaking only 20 percent of the meeting so it, it can give me live feedback on how to change so that i think you know it takes effort to effectively use AI in your day. But when you find the right use cases for you and what your job is, it's it's super incredible. But like if I was in, you know, uh, a graduate or, or early career role, I would be using it for everything because so much of my initial jobs were like writing reports, done. AI would do that shit for me straight away. If I was a consultant, I feel like I could work two hours a day, like easily because mm-hmm. um, it's just about like content creation um, and, and report nice. writing, which is so much easier. And it really is like translating your insights now has gotten so much quicker. I find too, if you add it with just a little bit of automation with the no code tools like Zapier and things like that, I'm building a system that's going to be effectively my, we have, I'm basically a a solopreneur here, but I'm like, I can have a CRM system where for every call, can you automatically, as soon as I drop the recording in a folder, um, you take the transcript, um, you summarize it and you put it in an Airtable database with the date and time and who this was. Um, pull out some keywords so I can search out like who was that call I had about topic X really quickly in a narrative out of my my CRM I'm like I I built that myself very quickly in a couple hours without any code right and so those are the (laughs) I love that idea so much I feel like I was like I'm trying to keep so much stuff in my brain right now right and I always trying to keep and you're like okay, that, that may be the, the thing we, we lose <laughs> as humans. Yeah. Like we no longer can multiply 547 by 342, yeah. you know, without our calculators that it's like, oh, if, can we let go of like every action item I said, remember to do that yeah. to myself, right? That it's like, that comes out automatically from the yeah. transcripts. Yeah, I'm, I'm stealing that idea. I'm doing that uh, maybe today. <laughs> That's such a good idea. But you know, also just other stuff that I don't use, but I know is out there. Like there's so much. If you just if you put the work in, you search. There's going to be stuff out there. But like stuff like e-commerce and and SaaS. Like when you're doing Facebook and Google ads now, there are huge AI tools built into that to like make more effective ads. Where instead of just doing two or ten iterations, you can do thousands of iterations of your ads. So you can like increase your click through rates with website creation. I, I think it's Wix maybe, but I was looking at one the other day. Like you can create websites so, so easily now. It's actually crazy. And it's not the most perfect website, but it's pretty freaking good compared to like half of the websites on the internet. Um, and it's just automatic with a small prompt. Canva and creating design resources. Damn, that's easy. Like yeah. they can create, they create full presentations for you. Oh yeah. A full presentation. It's wild. So, you know, it's not hyped. It's really fucking good. Just use it and invest the time in to find the tools that work for you. Exactly. This is not a trend that's going away. I would say like when it comes to whether this is hyped or not, I'm staggered that I'm like, this is the most revolutionary technology to come come around, you know, since the industrial revolution, it'll have that kind of yeah. effect on society. And yet somehow the media has managed to kind of overhype it. <laughs> like <laughs> congratulations media, right? Yeah. Where a lot of this, like a lot of it's about the fear and it taking over the world, et cetera. Of course, there's, you know, there's definitely risks we need to mitigate, but I, I just think they get really overblown. And then I, there's also just this idea of like, it's going to solve every problem. And yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those, like, it's, it's a tool, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's like any tool. It's not like you can't just put a backhoe in your backyard and expect it to dig it up. Right. right. Um, we are seeing more and more, you know, amazing things where you just give these things objectives with the agent like systems and they can spawn off several different jobs and the jobs can like critique each other and improve their answers and come back when it's a certain quality. Like that stuff is super interesting to me. It's not quite, you know, any, it's not anywhere near enterprise grade right now. Um, and it's not quite usable, but it's coming. Like people are iterating so quickly on this that if you're not already planning for that and and realizing that that will be here, you're going to be, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. Well, let's use that to close this one out. So ambassador number seven, nine Oh seven two AI, it's getting a lot of media attention, but it's not just hype. This is real and AI is coming now and it's here and it's going to continue to come and get better and better. It, it is the worst it will ever be right now. Mm-hmm. So 
Invest your time in it. Find the tools that can make your life better because there are tools that will radically change your day to day. And and if you just put the time in, you will have a way better job. Like you will like your job a whole lot better because you can just remove a whole lot of the, the boring shit that you do. And as a company level, you need to think about how it's going to either change your business for good or potentially disrupt it for bad. Like be conscious because you need to invest in it because it, it is changing stuff. And if you can be on the front of it and you can be open to it, I think it can be massive for you. 100%, I would agree. It's definitely um, an area that I understand why some people have been skeptical because it's take, taking a while to operationalize longer than some yeah. people thought. It isn't a magic bullet for all problems. That doesn't mean it's anything less than revolutionary. And yeah. the more you get your hands on, I think the more, the less afraid of it you'll be, but also the more accessible that you see how easy it is to use. Yeah. All right, well, that one's closed out. Ambassador, you've been advised and that's all. <laughs> and we'll move on to the next challenge. Nice. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, this challenge is called scaling a company with two people. Do you think in the near future, new big tech companies will be ran with two to four people using AI? It's already hmm. happening at a small scale because of the tech by... Do you think it's... It's already happening at a small scale because tech by nature automates. Hmm. I heard that Craigslist has a team of about 25 people. Plenty of Fish was built and ran by the founder and he hired like three consultants. Minecraft was said to be ran and built by the founder. I'm curious to learn what you think. How close are we away from this possibility? Do you think it's uh, even possible? From Valdestron. Yeah, um, super interesting. I think what we'll see is that um, the, the speed at which teams need to ramp up size-wise is, is gonna come later in the company. I just think you'll be able to do a lot more. There does come, I think, especially in like B2B situations, a time when a lot of your growth depends on human relationships and like you're, you're just, you're going to need a sales team at a certain point. Right. Um, and I also think there's that like diversity of skill sets is needed at a certain point too, right. That you're like the person who's going to oversee and deliver like a really awesome operations engine is like not the same person that you want out growing and creating new ideas about what we should build and interacting with customers and that kind of thing. Right. So it's, it's, um, I, but I do think that those smaller kind of that initial pod team, that's the founding team will be able to go farther on their own with the help of tooling before they get to like that first hire and before they have to start to grow, grow the team. But what do you think, Joel? Do you agree? Yeah. I absolutely think that founding teams can go further alone. Like yeah. AI can make anyone be able to do more stuff. Like whatever your job is pretty much. Like you, you can do more of it because you can you can automate the, the, the boring crap. But I don't think it's just AI that's helping with this. You know, like over the past 10 years, we've seen a huge trend of the, the, the creation and implementation of microservices where you don't have to do everything as a company. You can tie together a whole bunch of microservices that exist to do other shit in your business. So... I read um, Ask a Developer by Jeff Lawson, which is just a great book. Read that book if you haven't read that book. Like that's, that's a really good book and talking about like how to build great engineering teams. But he talks about this idea that he, he's confident that there will be a one person unicorn uh, at some point mm -hmm. in the future. And I don't know how far away that is, but I don't think every big tech company will be like that. But I do think there will be a unicorn, like a billion dollar valued company at that kind of level when there is very limited people. And and it is because there are so many, the, the ability to create uh, technology is so much easier now. So it's just gonna take like the right problem that is very easily implementable with a, with a simple software that people are willing to, to, to kind of pay for that I think will scale rapidly based with, with very little need for, for huge teams so mm -hmm. i think there will be a one person unicorn at some point i don't think it'll be that common though i still think these huge big tech companies are going to be big companies because of what you're saying Polly. like at that scale you need people you need people to to challenge the product like that they get enough to diverse input you need people to create the relationship for the enterprise contracts like you, you need people for a whole different set of reasons but and then the more people you have, the more people you need to just manage people as well, like, which is a challenge. But I, I think, you know, I think there will be a unicorn with one person. 
but I just don't think it's going to be the common thing. But I do think teams will be able to be smaller um, mm-hmm. to, to some extent or they will be able to achieve more if they're the same amount of people um, uh, as, yeah. as time goes 100%. by. Exactly. Obviously, like, we'll have those efficiencies. That's that's increasing rapidly. The, um, the, the single-person unicorn is interesting. I think it would have to be... It would have to be B2C, I think. Like, I just, again, I don't think you can do B2B at that scale. I think it would be B2B, though, is yeah. my gut feel. Yeah. I, I think it would be B2B, but like small end SaaS, like $20 a month or $50 okay. a month for, yeah. for like, a, like a tool Doesn't require. that maybe developers use or, or, or like a, a yeah. sales tool that like helps record your phone calls or, so, or so, I don't know what it is, but like some kind of small totally. B2B tool that it gets bought on an individual basis, yeah. but that a company pays for. Totally. And I, and I think I can see it. I think it, especially because I think people discount how much, like, especially in early stages, 75% right gets you most of the way there right yeah. that it, like if you're like it doesn't have to be the best code it has to work so a non-technical founder can sit down and just say like hey <laughs> write me the code for this or apparently show me a picture <laughs> yeah. i'm going to show you a picture of the website that i want to build um okay how do i get this up and running robustly how do i get ro- ro- robust and ro- running for a thousand more people you know um so that engineering challenges if the sales challenges stay out of your way because because like you said you've got a lower price product yeah. I, I, think I, I don't afternoon. think it'll happen. I just think it's possible, you know. <laughs> um, I don't think it's possible by me, <laughs> but I, I reckon I think at some point it will happen. I know there's definitely. I've, I remember there were there were folks out there trying who were like, "Let's all just have a shared GitHub page where we're all just tracking our efforts to basically use agents and say, build me a billion dollar business," and you know, spat out different ideas. People were getting, were trying out different ideas. Um, it's it's uh it's it's going to be amazing to see, but I do think if you're a small you know founding company right now and you're not taking advantage of this, you're crazy. Like yeah, that's wrong, it, bad not, idea, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind okay. of a gimme, especially with the pricing yeah. right now. All right, well let's close this one out for Valdestron. The final judgment here is, uh, we don't think that you'll see a lot of big new tech companies running with two to four people, um, b- because of AI. But I do think we'll see massive efficiencies where they can either be smaller or achieve more of that same amount of people. Uh, we, we, we absolutely think that, you know, c- companies and founding teams will be able to go a whole lot further without people because of microservices and because of AI and there are so many productivity hacks and you can do things that you would never have been able to do before on your own. And I think that there will be a one-person unicorn at some point in the future. I just don't know when, but I think that will come. There will be a point in time uh, and especially, I think AI will make that a lot more possible. Super right. interesting. Yeah. Well, that's it. Uh, Valdestron, you've been advised. And uh, we'll move on to our last question for today. So this question is called, what are your thoughts on AI startup moats? It seems that many of the AI powered products launched in late 2022 or early 23 have been made redundant by the advances in OpenAI's own products, most notably ChatGPT especially with, with all the plugins that are getting created. How would you describe the conditions required to avoid this kind of overnight redundancy? From Get Existential. <laughs> I love the name. It's so true. Same. This is like the question right now, right? Um, I feel like there were a record number of Gen AI startups that died little quiet deaths in Q3 2020, yeah. 2023 this year. Um, and I just, I kept being blown away that I felt like every month or so, not just OpenAI, but like Microsoft, the co-pilots, like boom, that was like a whole ecosystem of startups. So they're just like, sorry, yeah. everyone's already using our tools, right? Zoom releases transcripts. Unless their transcripts really suck, are you not gonna use them when they're part of their tool? Um, yeah. And what's interesting for things like Zoom and stuff is they're not charging for those features, at least yet. So they're kind of signaling like, this is just table stakes now for bigger companies. Um, And it's in a lot lot of cases, like we're definitely seeing that these are like massive accelerators for businesses that already had advantages of huge audiences, like any kind of stickiness to their product or lock-in because people are using them um, in an ecosystem, that kind of thing. 
Um, so that's a real moat for startups to get over, right? And they, they should be conscious of that, like, one of the first questions any investor will be asking them right now is, is this really, a, you know, its own thing? Or is this just a feature for Adobe or Microsoft or any of the bigger players that they could just implement in the same amount of time? Any of the wrappers that are just, you know, we took ChatGPT and did something funny with a prompt. Like, sorry, people can do that themselves. Maybe they're too lazy or not knowledgeable enough to do it. But there's quite likely if there's a big, big player in that ecosystem that's on their AI feature roadmap coming down the pike, right? Um, so there's the idea of more traditional factors besides tech being the moat now, right? It used it, This tech has just made um, something that used to be practically un unobtainable massively available to the whole ecosystem in a matter of months. So the more traditional modes are things like, do you have proprietary hard to get data that drives that you can use to decisions to drive value, right? We saw Bloomberg create their own GPT model based on their, their data content, right? They arguably have more NLP, you know, natural language, financial data than anyone else. So they're well positioned for that. So is there some kind of data moat you can create. Um, things like partnerships, right? And ecosystems, do you have um, like a vertical that you can, uh, integration you can do? Um, there's a really great book by Kai-Fu Lee um, called AI Superpowers. And he talks about the difference between uh, startups in San Francisco and the startups in China. And the biggest difference was that in San Francisco, we're very unwilling to integrate vertically and take on like the messy, like, meat space part of, of a, a business, right? If you were like a laundry startup, you would be a platform where laundromats can post and people can post and they meet up. You're not getting into the business of like, we're going to come to your office and pick up your laundry and deliver it to the laundromat and deliver it back as part of our business model, right? Chinese startups have had such a hyper competitive environment that that's like what they've had to do. And so they've gone around and been the game was like, who can buy up all the laundromats first? <laughs> That's yeah. who's going to win the the online laundromat <laughs> system and make it more convenient and come to your office and like collect your laundry out of your bedroom for you, right? Um, so that like vertical integration, the the big tech players who have those advantages are not going to be going into like a, in a niche vertical. They're not going to be going into the that more like on the ground meet space version of the, the the business right so that's like another place you can build a moat is actual like relationships and like physical physical goods physical operations um it's something that i think we'll see more of in north america which i'm very excited for because i really want a good laundry service <laughs> <laughs> this has just been a hack to try and get a better laundry service pitching in. really it's a big pitch <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know it's um it is a hard one. Like the, the technology is, is happening. It's, it's changing so rapidly now that you are seeing stuff get wiped out overnight. I, I think that almost like service approach as your differentiator, it's, it's almost like your approach to go to market needs to be services. And like you can use your platform as your proprietary way that makes you different, but services are, are what get people in the door. Then over time, as you get more revenue and you can create a better platform and you have the data, you then have that technological differentiator. But, but just just the, the platform itself is going to be challenging. What what I would say though is that this isn't really that new of a challenge. It's happening at, a, at an increased rate now. But startups have always had the challenge that that a, people have always like, what would stop Google doing this? Like people with a lot of money can build anything. Like any startup can just be replaced by by a big tech player at any point in time. It's faster now, but it's it's not a new risk. It's just a risk that, that, that I think people are, are a bit more aware of at the moment. So right. when you go into startups, you're going to get faced with these risks. And, and you're always actually going to have the same challenge, which is that if you're not building for a real problem where you, you're building real value for someone, then your business is fucked anyway. So I'll just say, you know, yes, you need to think a lot more uh, about this now. And there are other ways you can solve it. But but the the risk has always been there and it's it's going to continue to stay and it's probably just going to accelerate. But I think if you solve a problem where you're not just a feature, like when you're starting a business now, just just realize that if you're building a small add-on to something, you're probably going to get disrupted. 
So j- just be conscious of that. But if you could solve other problems, like there are still start AI startups today that are making tons of money, <laughs> like um, b- because they're, cause they're using AI to, to build something novel and to build something uh, super valuable that people are paying a lot of money for. And, and especially when you've either got the data for it or it is, you know, technologically novel with paint or, or whatever it is like there is still mm-hmm. a lot of business opportunities here i just think you you can't build something something that you know someone's about to build like like right. solve real problems it's a race. yeah it's a race to users yeah yeah exactly if, if it's a race to users really consider about whether that's the race you should be in <laughs> yeah exactly. if you you know if there's a lot of big incumbents um, and this is not, you know, uh, something where you've got some real novel, not reproducible tech on top of what's already out there. What's what's the point of starting that race, right? Yeah. And and also, to, to be fair, like, I'm also seeing the reverse in some ways. Like, there are a lot of companies that are getting started now because these bigger companies have gotten too bloated. So, like, uh, there's people that, like, challenge intercom for like is this huge customer success you know ticket management tool or type form like the, this huge forms tool like some people are coming out starting taking one small element of what these people do charging a much cheaper price and just marketing that well so like mm-hmm. the you don't just have to to create something new like where, where someone's going to attack you and copy your business you can also just copy other businesses at the same time so like it's you know it's this it's not just super clear i don't think it's so business dependent but i would say don't let this deter you just be just be conscious that this might happen in your business and have backup plans and have pivots ready to go that if that if google does just come and you know give out your software for free well what are the other applications of your software or or are you just better than google and people will still want to come to you just because microsoft uh you know releases a software it doesn't mean other people won't get additional softwares on top of that because you can do mm-hmm. a better job so yeah particularly Maybe for a niche right? yeah that's the um the, the 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 i really see that like the innovation at companies will now be like product and design led as opposed to tech led which is a nice flip in the ai space yeah. um but really yeah. understanding a segment of users the, the, the big advantage you have is that all these big companies are trying to appeal to the masses when, when they write a co-pilot for Word. Yes, there'll be some personalization. That's true. They can down, now do that at a scale they couldn't do before. But can you find a way that this really doesn't work for your, you know, your target market? Um, I do think it means that there'll be lots of smaller, smaller niche businesses. And I wonder, too, how many of those are really like, maybe we're seeing a decrease in like VC fundable or even needing VC funding, if they're able to go further or faster alone, right? With the yeah. help of AI, um, are we going to see more bootstrap businesses that are more like we're not we're not aiming to be the unicorns. We're not attempting to solve the big hairy problem. I've just got this killer business use case. It's niche enough that like the open AIs and the Microsofts of the world are never going to go after and up after it well enough to specifically solve this super well for my users. Um, and uh, that might be an opportunity point. Yeah. All right. Well, let's close this one out here. Where I feel like we're landing is having a technical moat isn't as easy as just having the technology anymore. Having the technology is is very simple and very cheap these days. So to have some kind of moat, it either needs to be from data or you need to be niched up selling an audience that no one really wants to compete with. Um, or, or you need to be... Uh, quick enough to keep pivoting to, to where the opportunity is. Mm-hmm. So this, although it's an increased risk and it's a faster risk, this risk has been around for a long time and, and a big company could always have replicated you. So just be very conscious of that now. Does it look like someone like Zoom is going to come and copy your business? Because anyone could have told you six months ago that they were going to do that. So just be conscious of, of where they're coming and build your business accordingly. And... Yeah, I think that's about it. There's a, there's a lot here, a lot to unpack. It's not a clear cut, but you know, a, a risk is a risk and it's worth being conscious of, but it's not worth um, bailing on your business. You know, keep, keep doing business, keep going in this space. There's still so much opportunity here. It's just about finding that right problem at the right time. Exactly. I, I love to say risk management doesn't mean never taking any risk. 
Yeah, <laughs> right? love that. It means being conscious of that, and feel the fear, but do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Be informed, right? Uh, because we do think the opportunities here are massive. I think we've <laughs> yeah, con- you know, concluded on that. Um, and they're not all going to be taken up by um, the massive big tech players. Yeah, they don't have time or the care, to be honest. Yeah. Um, awesome. All right. Well, that's it. We'll, we'll close that one out. So Valdestron, that's your advice. And uh, that comes to the last section of the show, plugs. So tell me, Polly, what's going on? What do you want to promote at the moment? Awesome. Yeah. So I am uh, currently I've been focusing a lot on uh, courses. So we have a couple courses that we're, we're, I'm teaching as part of uh, AI Career Boost. One's at uh, Reforge. So myself and Rupa Chattervedi, who's a design maven from Amazon as well as Google. She's currently a senior design manager at Uber. Um, we've both worked in AI, my, me from the product side, she, her from the design side. And we have an upcoming course uh, at, uh, in, happening in Reforge the week of October 25th. Um, I'm not sure when this podcast is going out. If we'll <laughs> we'll make we can, it in time, we'll try. Awesome, fantastic. Um, and then I were kicking off my signature program in January. So the AI Product Leader Blueprint is an eight week program designed to take experienced product leaders from sort of zero to hero in the AI space. Um, so it's one of the only programs that kind of has a 50 50 focus on traditional pre chat GPT AI as well as generative AI. Um, it'll take you through really the product skills needed, not only just the, the the tech side and developing that language to have a common communication language with your um, data science and engineering teams. We actually do a generative AI capstone project to kind of work through all the steps from evaluate from a creation to evaluation of a generative AI uh, uh, product and to get you hands on. So we're kicking off on January 17th and I'm, uh, I've got a wait list on my website if you are interested in more. I love it. Well, check them out. They, they sound super fun. Uh, I'll put links to all of that in the show notes as well. So if you want to check it all out, um, just go to the show notes, click on it, and, uh, and you can find more about Polly. I'll also put all of the links to her socials too and the, the AI After Hours podcast as well if you want to listen along. Um, on my side, uh, pull out your phone right now. Like and subscribe. Go to YouTube. Like and subscribe. You know, also comment on the videos. We want people commenting on the videos because I think that will grow the podcast. I'm not sure. It's just a guess. But comment on the videos. Nice comments only. Okay, we only like compliments in this podcast. Um, and then, as always, <laughs> we absolutely condone stealing phones. If you're going to like and subscribe on someone else's phone, so steal a phone, <laughs> take their phone, like and subscribe, add some nice comments on their phone too, and then give it back. Vigilante fans. That's what exactly. We want. Um, and look you know thank you to everyone who writes in we love these questions so if you've got problems and challenges in your startup send them through and uh, we'll workshop it with a guest send those through to podcast at joeldetrafani.com and I've got a booking link so if you want to chat product uh, startup challenges anything in this space um, I love this space love having these conversations I'd love to jump on a call and that's it we're going to wrap this one up Polly thank you so much for coming on thank you so much for sharing all this AI expertise Um, this has been a lot of fun Awesome. No, it's an absolute blast. Thanks so much. All right. This has been another episode of the Do As I Say podcast. We'll see you all next week.